Good afternoon and welcome. My name is David Wordley. I'm the Virtual Conferences Director of IORMA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, webinar. Just like to begin very briefly by saying a little bit about uh, IORMA and what the purpose of these webinars is, uh, and a little few housekeeping points before I hand over to today uh, called Callaghan. Now the IORMA Consumer Commerce Centre, it's a natural res uh, res neutral resource for those businesses and governments that recognise the need to understand and respond to the way in which the 7.8 billion global consumers are changing. And they're changing in the products and services they want and need and the ways in which they want to obtain them. And these changes are happening globally and they're driven by developments in society, in business and in technology. And this webinar on sustainable buildings is one of a series of thought leadership discussions and they're held every other Thursday and the topics that we are using are chosen from IORMA's horizon scanning, its surveys and research. Now, um, I would like to ask you to rem remember to type any questions that you have, and we do encourage questions, uh, into the Q&A button, which you will find at the bottom of the screen. You can use uh, text chat, uh, but our preference is that you use the um, Q&A button rather than the uh, chat button. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to... Uh, hand over to Carl Callahan, and if you'd uh, just unmute himself, and I'm going to make him the spotlight. Carl, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, welcome to this IOMA webinar on sustainable architecture and carbon neutrality. My name is Carl Callahan. I'm the head of architecture and visual arts at the University of East London, and I'll be your moderator for this session. I'll begin by introducing the panel, and we'll have a short introduction, probably about 10 minutes on some of the issues surrounding this topic. And at the end of the introduction, we'll have a short quiz so we can understand some responses to the issues raised. I'll then ask a series of questions to our panel of experts. And we'll also take questions from you as our audience. So please put questions in the Q&A. So could we have the first slide, please? Firstly, we've got Dr. Craig Robertson, um, who's Associate and Head of Sustainability at AHMM. So Craig, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for inviting me along to this IOMA webinar. Um, uh, I'm Craig Robertson. I'm Head of Sustainability at Alfred Hall Monaghan Morris Architects. We are a, a general architectural practice. Um, we work across all sectors. Um, my role within the business is, as lead on sustainability is to, uh, we work as a kind of internal consultancy. We have a building performance team uh, and we support our architects in innovation and developing sustainability strategies for their projects. We also carry out um, advocacy work across industry. So I'm a member of the RIBA Sustainable Futures Group and we have a, a kind of research program. Uh, we're currently working on um, research looking at net zero carbon buildings uh, with UCL's Institute of Environmental Design and Engineering. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Um, Heba El Shikawi. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Heba El Sharkawi. I'm a reader in architecture, cluster leader for architecture and design, and course leader for architecture at the University of East London. Before UEL, I was um, I worked at the World School of Architecture at Cardiff University for a few years. Launched a new masters on sustainable mega buildings, and before then, I was at the University of Nottingham doing my PhD and, and also teaching. Uh, my research focuses on an energy efficient uh, retrofit of homes and the impact of this on occupants' attitudes, behaviors. Um, um, and their health and well-being, obviously, following these energy upgrades. And my research thereafter continued in this area uh, by leading a British Council-funded project and uh, working with a New Home Council, Transport for London, Greater London Authority, and the Building Research Establishment on various projects from retrofitting council housing, energy performance of new housing prototypes, and the impact of green systems on reducing urban heat island. Um, my current research is looking at people's behaviour and lifestyles related to using their homes, post-COVID, uh, as well as the performance of their homes related to energy and thermal comfort as they shift towards working from home and uh, obviously taking account um, of climate, climate change. 
Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, Dr. Azif Din, please. Hi, uh, my name's Asif Din. I am Sustainability Director at Perkins & Will. It's, I have a similar sort of role to Craig, to be quite honest. Uh, um, I have over 20 years experience in designing zero carbon buildings. Um, I am part of Letty as a group and also um, UKGBC in trying to drive roadmaps forward in terms of uh, zero carbon and circular economy thinking. Uh, as part of my role at Perkins & Will, I have instigated that all projects should have a zero carbon roadmap at stage two of every project. And it's increasing the awareness to make sure that there's no negative feedback loops in any of these projects that I'm overlooking. And these projects scale from corporate interiors to master planning whole countries. So a wide range of work. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, and Sam Turner, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam Turner. I'm an architect based in London. Uh, I've been a project architect on new build, refurbishment and conservation projects across the UK. Uh, in October last year, I founded Resilient Works CIC, a social enterprise to conduct project, projects that uh, build and disseminate knowledge of low energy and regenerative design across the construction industry. My intention is to just be a catalyst in the construction industry to help uh, businesses and individuals to come to terms with climate change and to pivot their practices uh, from business as usual to more regenerative, truly sustainable and equitable work. Uh, I do some teaching at Central St. Martins and Manchester School of Architecture. I'm also uh, working with the RID Sustainable Futures Group, uh, helping to build the climate framework and we have sustainable principles through CPD and all of education. And I'm a member of the Architects Climate Action Network as a coordinator on the steering group. Uh, my current role is movement support coordinator, and I sort of fallen into this by accident. So, uh, really, it's just a concern for sustainable design and social justice, and uh, act activism, and uh, setting up this company has all all been a, a real accident for that. Um, thank you, Sam. Um, I think we'll start with the uh, introduction now. So if I can have the next slide. So just while, while we're doing that, yeah, if we could go on to the next slide, that's perfect, thank you. Um, I'll do a, a brief introduction, take about 10 minutes. And the purpose of this is really to give you a sort of common background to discussions everyone's starting with. Uh, a similar, at least, if, if this is totally new to this area, we have a similar uh, kind of uh, knowledge base um, that we can work from. Then we'll go into uh, more detail, hopefully, in questions from you uh, and uh, questions uh, to the panel. So um, this is a comparison to cities. So modern humans left Africa about 50,000 years ago and spread across the planet. 3,000 years ago, we could live in sustainable cities like ancient Athens. So how long could human life continue on Earth? Estimates of this vary, but looking at the sun alone, it could be many millions of years, and some suggest even 200 million years. So the point I want to raise right at the beginning is we're right at the beginning of understanding uh, architecture, understanding cities. We don't have all the answers. Sustainability is very I, I'm sorry for uh, interrupting. Um, I, I, I do have to apologize that I have lost my audio. I cannot hear anything that's going on. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, sort that problem out at the, at the moment. Um, so unfortunately, I can't hear any prompts to advance the slides. Um, okay. So I, but, I'm going David, to I will, I will make um, uh, ask if someone can take over uh, from uh, advancing the slides. Um, or, or at least notify me of when the next slide. Uh, could you do that through through the chat button? Um, if you type in yeah. next slide or put your hand up when you want the next slide and I'll advance to the next slide. Okay. Good, good, that's fine. I'll put my hand up. Um, okay, so sustainability is very complex and covers many fields, but for this talk, we need to consider two main aspects. Uh, can we go back one slide? Sorry, can we go? Oh, just see if I can get into chat. Okay. 
Yeah. Sorry, we're going forward at the moment. We need to go back. I can I can try share my screen. I, I hope it works and um, I can try and take control. Oh, I cannot until uh, yeah, the other participant is sharing. Yeah, uh, Carl, Jane is saying we can just uh, press on without um, without the slides if that's okay. Uh, okay, I think it will make sense if we can get the slides working, but I'll continue on and we'll, we'll try and get the slides working as I'm talking. So carbon neutrality means having a balance between emitting carbon and absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and carbon sinks, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then storing it is known as carbon sequestration. And this happens in oceans, forests and soil. And to, in order to achieve net zero emissions, all world, uh, worldwide greenhouse gas emissions will have to be carbon sequestration currently we emit about four times what we absorb. The target for achieving balance is 2050. In short, if you can reduce the amount of carbon you emit, you can reduce the amount of absorption that you need uh, to achieve balance. Um, this slide uh, at the beginning is looking at two comparison of two cities. We've got Athens 3000 years ago and contemporary London. It's very obvious that the architecture has changed substantially due to innovation. And they, although we think of architecture as permanent, relative to our own lives. In fact, architecture needs to change and develop and adapt. The innovations we can see here include the lift or elevator, which massively increases the density. There's levels of servicing, air conditioning, lighting, fresh and wastewater, telecommunications, and so on. And the night view shows the city radiating energy. So we're tempted to think the modern city is better. But are these cities equal in terms of sustainability? Clearly, Athens is using less energy. The materials are all locally sourced, timber, stone, for example, uh, and there are very few services. London, by contrast, built on steel frames from China, glazing from Europe, and so on, and so on. It's also a highly serviced city. The hinterland of London has also changed to supply food, not only fields around the city, but also food from around the world. And this becomes an issue when half the world's population is living in similar cities. So where are the new archetypes of building that will solve the sustainability issue? What do we do with the new elements of the city and what do we do with the existing city to make it more sustainable? These I suggest are the main questions for contemporary architecture. In the 21st century, it's important to note that our understanding of architecture has radically changed from the start of the 20th century, for example. We now view architecture as part of an ecosystem and not as an isolated building. Buildings contribute about 40% of our carbon footprint. The first prototype buildings of modern architecture in the 20th century were designed before the 1930s and before the understanding of ecosystems. Post-war architecture largely copied and developed these early prototypes. Broadly speaking, architecture in the 20th century did not therefore engage with sustainability. The first use of the word ecosystem here in the UK was Tansley in 1935. Tansley was a botanist and botanists considered how things work together, how did humans, plants, the soil, temperature, oxygen, carbon dioxide, insects, even worms, work together as an ecosystem. And this was new thinking. Botanists realized the ecosystem were un was under threat and in 1949, the government acted to bring in the Countryside Act and create nature reserves. And at this point, most people thought this was kind of job done. In 1962, uh, Rachel Carson changed all this and she wrote Silent Spring, which showed the impacts of industrial farming. And this really changed the scale of concerns about the impacts on the ecosystem. Research flowed into oceans, air quality, temperature change, and so on, revealing that the, earth, the ecosystem on Earth was changing rapidly. Climate change was happening and we needed to re-establish a long-term ecosystem to preserve human life. The main contributor to climate change is CO2 emissions. 
This September, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow will propose a 78% cut in CO2 by 2035 relative to 1990 levels. And if we just go back a little bit on, on 7th of October 2020, the European Parliament backed climate neutrality by 2050 and a 6% emission uh, target um, compared to 1990 levels. So the new target, um, which we're hoping to adopt in September, if it is adopted, will step up reductions by 18% above the current target. And the overall aim of these targets would be to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And this would limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, next. Uh, I wanted to start with an example of facing up to challenges successfully. And the last really major challenge to redirect architecture in London was the Great Fire in 1666. The building industry was producing timber buildings by guilds of craftsmen. And suddenly the government intervened to say all new buildings after the fire had to be fireproof. A hundred years later, London had developed a model house which was surrounded by brickwork, pretty much the same original timber house surrounded by brickwork. Uh, this retained the timber interior and core, um, but it was uh, fireproof. The model was immensely successful and with stylistic variations was the basis of most building in the city between 1750 and 1950. It was, however, less sustainable than the pre-fire buildings. Both buildings could be dismantled and reused. But the bricks in the new architecture needed firing and transporting to the city. This increased the embodied energy of the construction, and that's the start of a kind of pattern which we then follow. The new buildings also used more energy, and a typical five story house could have up to 10 fireplaces. So, embodied energy and energy consumption servicing the house or building went up. So, we'd solved the problems of fire, but we'd done so with a less sustainable building, and that pattern pretty much follows. The main point of this slide uh, is to show that it's possible to take on very substantial changes and challenges to the building industry uh, and, to, uh, and to find successful outcomes uh, to those challenges like this. Case study two, how much energy are we actually using and how much carbon dioxide do we produce? Um, if you want to reduce carbon, the first place to start is an audit. Uh, this is an audit of the University of East London. It's a modern university with mostly modern buildings built post-war and obeying building codes. It's also located in the southeast of England, which has a moderate climate. So this is probably a middle case and not the worst case. On the far right, uh, we can see that we're producing 4,000 tonnes of carbon. So that's a pretty frightening pretty frightening kind of realization. So how do we reduce this? The easy wins are probably around building services and reducing waste. Um, next slide, please. Um, but I mean, to, to progress this, we need to uh, set targets and monitor our progress kind of regularly. There are a number of smart systems available which can help with this. The university has decided to reduce carbon ideally by 10% a year. The university recognises the need for everyone to work together on this. Researchers, technologists, product manufacturers, but also staff and students. We need to solve as a community with shared values and to carry out energy audits and develop action plans to monitor the reductions as necessary. There are many new options for energy sources that reduce carbon and increase energy efficiency, including control of heating, lighting, water, and so on. But to reduce energy substantially, you may be required to look at the building enclosure in detail. So what are the new approaches we might consider? The starting point is setting ambitious targets in the early design phase. Solutions will be specific to each project. There's a wide variety of options. And in this slide, we're considering only four around energy and life cycle, looking at the building envelope and structure. And that's because probably this is where you get the most gains in reducing carbon. Um, with existing buildings, we can insulate on the inside or outside. And this is a very good way of uh, reducing energy loss and therefore the scale of the plants that you need to provide heating. 
Um, there are also uh, benefits and impacts to both of these approaches, um, but they can both uh, reduce carbon emissions substantially. Um, on new builds, uh, there are sophisticated monitoring options in the design phase evaluating the energy footprint and often will be going for very highly insulated buildings. This wall, for example, shows 375 millimetres of wall insulation, which is kind of unheard of, uh, certainly 20 years ago. Um, these very highly insulated buildings um, can also have issues around overheating and well-being. So there's question marks about whether that is the direction we should be going in. Um, and I think, so apart from looking at the envelope of the building, which is kind of what was happening in the fire of London, people were really changing the envelope to brickwork. And so reviewing the envelope of the building could be one way in thinking our way into this. But we also need to think about the structure uh, from the point of view of recycling. So on new builds, we've got the opportunity of considering recycling as a primary structure in the design process. So the photo on the right shows a Haygate estate in London, which had 1,200 homes and was demolished after 44 years of use. Um, this is clearly not sustainable. So do we need to consider recycling of the primary structure at the design stage of a new build? So I think this, these are some of the issues that we're, we're facing. So I think um, at this point, it would be good, David, if we could have the quiz. I'm not sure how we could, maybe somebody put that in the chat, it would be good. So whilst David's getting together the quiz questions, um, I know there are various versions of Zoom and some of you may or may not be able to see the quiz questions, but I'll, I'll make a start on these and then we'll have a few minutes while you can um, uh, while you can put in your, your views. So I think the, the question number one should be appearing on your screen shortly um, is, are you familiar with some of the measures um, that your government is putting into legislation to improve energy efficiency of buildings? So that's the first question. And the second question is, are you personally considering how you could make your home or office or workplace or organisation more energy efficient? So how active are you going to be? So the first question is really looking at how informed are you? And the second question is how active are you uh, in taking this on? So if you could, if you could just uh, continue with that. And then I think we'll open the, the questions. So it looks like we're medium informed, uh, exactly split down the middle informed and um, but we all want to make a difference. And I think that's probably a very good place to be as we go into our questions. So um, I think first question, which I'd like to put to uh, Heather, I'd like to start us off is, how can organizations and leadership embrace developments in sustainable design as part of their mission? Uh, thanks, Heather, Carl. would you like to start on that? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction as well, uh, which links to a lot of um, obviously what we were, will be discussing um, this afternoon. So um, I want to make it quite short and, and brief so other panelists can also contribute. And uh, I think there needs to be a radical change in how the built environment sector operates as a whole. And organizations need to fully appreciate the scale of climate change and that it is really happening with natural disasters happening across the world from storms, floods and wildfires. Um, so organizations, I believe, need to genuinely address sustainability at all levels within their organizations. And perhaps um, some of them might need to move away from the, you know, kind of the, the greenwashing um, approach, which might not be as genuine as um, and not as effective as, as you know, genuinely uh, uh, addressing it. Um, I think also leadership needs to be aware of the net zero carbon buildings commitment uh, launched at the Global Climate Action Summit in 2018. And uh, this challenges businesses, organizations, cities, and countries for all, for all buildings to be net zero by uh, 2050, uh, net zero carbon in operation. Um, I think in the UK, construction, demolition, excavation, as we mentioned before, accounts for around 60% of material use and waste generation. So organizations within the built environment can formulate strategies which are consistent um, with the net zero carbon buildings commitment ultimately leading to the you know, more climate res resilient developments 
Um, they need to fully adopt the principles of circular economy um, and to improve operational efficiency, achieve significant economic you know, savings, and eventually reach the net zero carbon uh, target. Uh, just a minor example of an organization, which is uh, uh, the University of East London, which you mentioned, Carl, briefly. But uh, as we launched the net zero carbon campus project, um, UVL will achieve net zero carbon by 2030. And this will be that we've already created an, an energy master plan with Siemens and other partners in the industry aiming to lower our operational costs, um, increase the use of renewable energies and attract investors who will be uh, helping us consider the carbon risk and achieve the, the um, net zero carbon by 2030. Um, then that's, that's just in a, in a kind of a brief um, from myself. Good, thank you, Heather. Um, Sam, how do you feel about this? Um, looking here at, um, how can organizations and their leadership embrace developments in sustainable design as part of their mission? Yeah, I think this is a huge thing that um, we really need to take on, on board. There's um, all of our staff and our customers are becoming so much more climate conscious right now that it has to be a fundamental part of every business. Um, we're currently living in this extractive economy that's stripping resources from uh, the planet and from from the people that we're employing um so we need to fundamentally change this this mindset this this idea of infinite growth on a finite planet um we need to start understanding that net zero isn't good enough that just becoming balanced that the the sort of positives balance the negatives i don't think that's good enough i think we need to be aiming for the positive to far exceed the negatives, to be looking at this more regenerative worldview where we value people, nature, and we work together more fairly and collaboratively. So businesses and industry leaders really need to step up to take this, this leadership position seriously, put our heads above the parapet and, uh, and sort of stop before we get stuck in the ruins of the castles that we've built. Um, we need to realise the externalities of, of what we're doing, the, the public health implications and the environmental and social injustices that our current practices wreak upon the world um, and work, work together to promote more health and well-being um, and with more compassion, really. That's what I would really love to encourage is a compassionate worldview. Um, and I think business leaders need to take that at heart. To heart. So... Sam, thanks a lot for that. Um, I, one of the things that um, did, uh, I, I just put a slide in about the Haygate estate, which is the building we saw being demolished. But as you're talking there, I was sort of reminded of that slide. And it was quite an astonishing decision from a sustainability point of view, because it's obviously taken quite a high level um, to demolish 1,200 homes made of concrete. Um, and to, uh, one wonders really about the, the team taking the decision and what the mission was there. Um, so I think we could continue, um, maybe Azif, um, how can organisations and leadership embrace developments in sustainable design as part of their mission? What's important about getting the mission right? Well, the mission effectively is a complicated one. And it's actually embracing that complexity and actually looking at a range of different aspects and seeing where the negative feedback loops actually are. Um, in terms of organizations, this actually needs a more holistic view. It's actually looking at it, as you've said, Carl, as an ecosystem, as opposed to a single metric. You know, sort of like if we just go down, you know, sort of like uh, the carbon route, we're going to end up in very, very much a negative feedback situation um, if you're just going to target a single value. We have to actually be thinking about things that are embedded within the uh, systems at a much larger level. So it might mean actually for leadership to actually start dismantling existing models, unfortunately. We cannot, as Sam said, still continue in terms of the infinite growth uh, GDP type approach. It is requires something that needs to be embedded at a very, very early level and to make sure that something is truly sustainable in terms of the Bertland type definition of something for future generations, as opposed to just thinking for now. Thank you. Thanks, Azib. 
Um, I think that really is, you know, it's really interesting if you start thinking about what the city would be like in 3,000 years' time. I'm, I'm always wondering where will, where will we even have materials in 300 years' time to start building? You know, what, what will happen when the copper runs out and all the other things? Um, Craig. Thank you, Carl. Um, and going last gives me the benefit of building on, on what everybody said. And I agree with what everybody has said. Um, the kind of genuine change needed that, that Heber mentioned to the, the, the fundamentalness of that genuine change that Sam mentioned uh, to a regenerative, compassionate, uh, very different economy and perhaps dismantling some of the existing structures and existing uh, modes of operation that we currently have, I, I agree with. Uh, and what I was going to say was in to, uh, to do that, what I, in my job, I'm often trying to find the lever, find why people care about this. So I think what we have to do and what business leaders have to do is find the positive overlaps with your current ambitions, because there's lots of great stuff that can come out of this. It, the, the, the world that we're describing is one where people are healthier, happier, they've got better connections to nature, to each other. Um, we're, we're a more productive society. And I don't just mean, I don't mean GDP terms, I mean kind of productive in kind of mental health, physical health, um, society socially all of these things so we we have to find the le the overlap the overlapping levers with our current ambitions uh, identify them in this new paradigm that we're talking about and then use them to drive our, our businesses forward it's finding those overlaps and the positive case for them so thank you Kate. craig i mean i think what we're suggesting or talking about here is um perhaps a very broad mission around sustainability and situating um, the problem of carbon in this bigger uh, kind of mission, um, you know, which, which has very much more to contribute uh, to to the kind of evolution of how we design um, at the moment. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit if we can. So, how can innovative energy efficiency technology influence building design and performance over the next ten years? So, and I know there are different camps on this. There's sort of this high, a sort of high tech camp that thinks. The future is all high tech and there's also a kind of low tech camp that is kind of trying to simplify. So uh, I'd be quite interested to hear uh, your views on that. So I think, um, Heber, would you like to start with that? How can innovative energy system, energy efficient technology influence building design and performance, say, over the next 10 years? Um, I, I, I think buildings need not to be conceived as relying on technology, rather adapting technologies and um, I, I think we need to appreciate the roots and, and um, the basis of the evolution of any technology, not just for the purpose of using it, but understand and critically assess why and how it should be best, how it would be best um, adopted. Um, I, I think we also need to bear in mind that much of the innovative technologies that we have nowadays, they, they actually stem from um, the natural evolution of vernacular design techniques and building materials where back in history, where you also mentioned in, in the comparison between Athens and London, uh, building design was fully responsive to the climate and, and context and, and buildings performed as they were designed to perform, um, even with the heating and cooling systems, which were very kind of uh, very, very extremely low tech, if, if any tech. Um, but of course, at that time, people's expectations were not as where we are at today. Um, However, I believe passive design technologies are still key to energy efficient technologies, such as thermal mass capacity of materials, the shading for solar control, very simple and very intuitive. It doesn't have to be super high uh, tech, um, using even the, the thermal physical properties of, of air for natural ventilation. And all of these were actually, they, they were used throughout history. So um, building on those and and making sure that, again, the new technologies, they do link back to, in, in some way, it doesn't have to be in, in every way, but in some way to uh, when they were best used and, and were most effective. Um, and we could see many of those concepts of, of passive design um, in, in most, if not all, of the BRIAM excellent outstanding buildings, as well as LEED, uh, platinum, and, uh, platinum, and so on. Um, um, and I, I think also there is a, a, another intuitive strategy, which is also not that high Tech, but it could be also quite you know, effective is the use of urban green systems uh, from green facades, green roofs and, and vegetation, um, which has always proven quite advantages in, in multiple ways in, in terms of improving microclimates, improving air quality, absorbing carbon, um, minimizing noise levels, optimizing building um, energy performance, if and when they're used for shading, for insulation, 
And also, really importantly, what what we, what Craig touched on is is to help improve people's mental health, well-being, and productivity. Um, and there's a lot of research on biophilic design and how this actually affects um, uh, people's uh, mental health and well-being. Besides also being efficient for in terms of um, environmental performance of, of buildings, um, I think we also need to acknowledge that climate is changing. It is really changing, and with an expected rise of up to five degrees centigrade in London by 2070 in summer. So buildings need to be designing buildings need to take into consideration that they adapt and adjust to this rise in temperatures. Um, and and uh, you know an example we've done in uh, in uh, one of my research uh, my recent research projects was to look into uh, future climate scenarios and the impact on uh, retrofit of buildings. And we found that um, there is a high possibility if we use the best um, thermal transmittance of, for the building fabric, particularly the walls, there's a higher risk, much higher risk of overheating um, and affecting thermal comfort. So I think we, we need to take this into consideration that the climate is changing and that the new technologies and new uh, building design need to accommodate this. Um, and lastly, we shouldn't ignore the um, post-occupancy evaluations of buildings and learning in assessing um, user experiences um, following occupying their buildings. We need to understand where the failures were and uh, come up with you know, future and, and potential ways of um, improving um, design. Um, and yeah, analyzing results then will help improve building design going forward. Um, and that's, that's for me, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Heather. And Sam, how do you uh, feel about this? Um, you know, how can uh, energy efficiency technology influence building design and performance over the next 10 years? I mean, if we went back to, you know, 1950s, 60s, everyone was kind of installing air conditioning and this got into a massive fancy. We had a huge belief in technology, but technology now is kind of changing and people are looking at um, innovative energy technologies of various kinds influencing building design. So how do you think we can take this forward? Yeah, I, I'm always very wary when you mm, use can, can technology not be the enemy is what, I, what I'm trying to hint at here. There's, there's yeah. a role for kind of <laughs> I think I love gadgets. I love uh, tools and, and new ways of doing things. I mean, that's part of why I became an architect. I love taking things apart and putting them back together and seeing how you can solve a problem. And that's all technology is, right? It's solving a problem and doing it in better and better ways. Um, but... I'm very wary of putting our faith in sort of unrealized or new untested technology. And I think we generally have all of the technology, all of the tools we need to build a zero carbon world right now. And we don't need to wait for um, hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or um, like nuclear fission to be invented for us to like do this we we can do this right now and that's something that i want to make sure people really understand is that really it's a mindset it's getting making sure that you're using things efficiently that you're really thinking about the effects of everything you do um so i think more than sort of trying to find the most efficient um uh insulation material vapor barrier or trying to cover your building in solar panels and things like that really we should just be identifying the sort of fabric that we have and making sure that that's working as well as it can that we're appreciating all of that embodied carbon the, the carbon that's been released into the atmosphere already and is already there um so why not use what that has created um and and uh would sort you be, I mean, just, just to sort of uh, broaden this a little bit, I mean, if mm -hmm. we take very highly insulated buildings like, um, I'm trying to think, Passive House or something like that, which is using a much, uh, you know, very highly sealed uh, buildings and they require uh, mechanical extra kind of ventilation, mm -hmm. um, heat recovery systems of various kinds running pretty much permanently kind of all through the winter at least. So would you regard that kind of technology as a step too far, or do you think there's a place for, for these super insulated um, buildings? I think there's totally a place for them. And the, our new buildings need to be high performance, finely tuned machines that, that really are uh, airtight and, and we're using the technology we can 
uh, in those buildings to make sure they perform very well. But with that, 70% of new buildings' carbon emissions could be in their embodied carbon. So that's a huge burp that we're releasing right now into the atmosphere. And no matter how efficient the building is over its lifespan, we've released that right now. So uh, I've done some research trying to find how many solar panels you would need to put on a mansion that I was helping to, to design uh, to make it carbon neutral. We could, we could take it down, but ultimately our energy grid is decarbonizing. So there was no payback period that those uh, solar panels would pay for themselves, let alone pay off the, the carbon burp from the building. Um, so I think we just need to be really careful and, and sort of considered in our approach to things and make sure that we're, we're sort of using natural materials. We're, we're sort of using the materials efficiently and making buildings that really last. Uh, ultimately, a building that lasts for 200 years is going to be far more energy efficient than or more uh, effective in its carbon emissions than a building that is built and knocked down 20 years later. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what we're seeing uh, in the recent sort of construction industry. Um, Azeev, what, what's your view on this? I mean, uh, energy efficiency technology influencing buildings over the next 10 years, where do, you, where do we stand on that? Right, well, uh, quite a lot has been covered by Heber and Sam already, so it's kind of hard not to overlap. Um, Look at it this way. In terms of the future, we are going to be building less. Now, what we're going to be doing is refurbing more. This goes back to what you said earlier, Carl, about Haygate. The amount of embodied carbon that is in quite a lot of structures out there is something that we have to reappropriate. We have to adapt and use buildings in a different way. So part of the actual technology side is to try to design it out as much as possible. Now, this might be sort of like a Luddite solution, effectively, of saying we don't want technology ever. But technology is useful only when the rest of the fabric has been upgraded enough. Otherwise, you're going to end up in the scenario like, I don't know, like in terms of offsets, in terms of uh, building and carbon, and that you can buy your way out of it. You cannot bolt your way out of uh, a poorly performing building by just putting in more and more technology. What you have to do is follow effectively the lean, clean, green, but really concentrate on the lean. So what you're actually putting in is the right thing for the right job. And most of that time, most of the time, that is about measurement. So it's the internet of things, it's about control. But you know, sort of like, I'm sure other people around the table will know putting in sort of like uh, control mechanisms, like the early days example for B of BMSs or building management systems, they were atrocious. And, you know, we still have the performance gap now, which is absolutely huge. So it's about making sure that we focus front end first and then put appropriate technology in when we need it. Craig, th thanks, Azu. Craig, so innovative, energy efficient technology, um, how's that going to influence design? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, as Asif said, um, I, I'm probably about to agree with, with a lot of what, what people have said, which doesn't make for a good um, challenging conversation. But so we, we work with a lot <laughs> of um, tech companies. So the very people who are developing lots of innovative building controls. Um, and we could throw, much, throw so much tech at our, our buildings uh, that these companies are developing through AI and other, other means that the architecture almost becomes irrelevant. Um, and obviously that's not in my interest as an architect, but I don't think it's in the kind of wider society's interest either, because you said earlier, Carl, that a building, the architecture's role has changed radically over time. It has, but in some respects, it is exactly the same. The skin of a building is an environmental modifier. It's just doing simple physics between outside and inside, and that's not going to change. Obviously, the external conditions are going to change over time as the climate changes over time. Uh, but the, the role of the building fabric as modifying inside to out and creating a safe, dry, warm space, functional space inside is the same. So... 
I, I see the role of technology much as Asif has just described. It's in um, the design process, about understanding that dynamic between inside and out. It's about uh, understanding the changes in that dynamic through functional change in the inside of the building and society and climate change th through outside of the building and being able to kind of optimise that fabric, which can be very simple, very passive, made of natural materials, as Sam says, uh, it's optimizing that fabric to make it the most efficient in terms of resource use, carbon intensity, uh, designing in replaceability, reusability, treating the building as a future resource bank. All of these things, the technology is in is in how we explore those ideas, not necessarily in the building itself. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to slightly change tack now, and again uh, that Haygate slide, which I put in. Uh, showing the, the building um, construction uh, and concrete which is being demolished. Um, but the question is really how can ease of construction be reconciled with sustainability? What do we need to kind of think about when we're building? And are there kind of changes in the building industry? We looked at the fire of London between the kind of guilds of cross and producing timber buildings and then kind of shifting off to shifting out into uh, new jobs like being, you know, sort of bricklayer, which are kind of taking over as massive importance uh, in the building industry. So there's obviously a relationship between these changes in kind of construction and how we reconcile those with sustainability. So um, Heber, I mean, would you like to start on that one? Sure, thanks, Carl. Again, it, it, I mean, it's it's it really ni nicely ties in with what we've what we've just uh, discussed and. Um, I think um, there are. I've had I had a, a few points uh, which I'll try and run through quite quick. Uh, so I think off-site construction, prefabrication of materials and components is one way. This could be assisted with obviously building information uh, modeling. Um, there's construction waste management, which is again what we've just mentioned: recycling materials um, on-site, using reclaimed materials um, or components in situ. Um, and you know, the minimizing the processing that is needed as much as possible. For example, you, reuse of, of steel beams and columns from a um, a, a dismantled building, for example. Um, um, also, something we touched on, I think, as you've touched on, is is applying the lean uh, principles, um, which is more like creating more value for customers with fewer resources, and this helps in also reducing energy consumption, waste, and reducing cost. Um, we can, and then moving on to materials, um, choosing strategically the materials that are being used um, from recycled products. Um, as an example, the London Olympic Park, I, I know that it's, it's achieved more than 20% of recycled content of the entire construction works. And uh, this was, you know, uh, 2012. Um, we can use natural materials, more natural materials, such as timber in preference to steel where possible, um, hempcrete, straw bales, um, ideally locally sourced. Again, this this again helps in the in, in terms of the um, issue with embodied carbon um, and environmental impact of materials. Um, and then again, back to the circular economy principles. I think this these these really need to be um, properly embedded and properly applied. And we need, we need to design for deconstruction, um, meaning designing and constructing for the reuse and the recycle. Of the at the end of life um, of, of buildings, um, so I think that, that this could be you know these are just a few a few ideas. Yeah, and I'm slightly thanks. Emma, I'm slightly regretting uh, how I posed that question. I was saying about how can the ease of construction be reconciled, but maybe I should have said how can the ease of reconstruction be reconciled if we're actually going to be recycling these buildings and building products a number of times. Um, so, Sam, if you have any thoughts on this, how can construction be reconciled with sustainability? Yeah, I think it's, it's about thinking about our buildings differently. It's about seeing them as material libraries, that we're collecting stuff together, we're building into the, the we're forming it into the building that we want it to be right then, but that may change over time, and we may knock parts of that building down or rebuild them, or we may reuse that uh, material entirely in something else and that's building this circular economy this this place where nothing is wasted nothing is sent to landfill and waste is just stuff in the wrong place so um with that as the mindset we can start thinking about buildings more modularly and, and 
I really look forward to um, more off-site construction, more factories building, uh, just transporting to site just what is needed in a way that is simple to construct. So your on-site time is much less. You're only paying for what you get to site. I'm living right next to a building site now, a traditional um, London, New London vernacular flat, flat block. And the amount of waste that happens on that regular building site is incredible. And we're paying for that in the, in the construction that we're, we're sort of, you know, construction. And then we're paying for it when it goes to waste to landfill. And we're paying for it in the health, the dust and the, the sort of noxious fumes that are coming from those sites. So I think we need to really embrace modern methods of construction, building things in factories, and making making modular buildings that can then be deconstructed, and yes, with natural materials, because ultimately they sh our buildings should be locking up carbon. We emit so much carbon in other things that we do as part of construction. So the materials that we use need to offset that and help us to become that sort of net zero or net positive. Uh, these these carbon stores that are helping the rest of society to to take to suck carbon out of the atmosphere um, and it's not all just about carbon it's it's about sort of uh, many other um, toxins and sort of uh, and effects from our construction industry so I think we can we can promote cleaner more efficient ways of doing things um, and that's really how sustainability and a uh, better building uh, industry can be reconciled into what we're doing right now. Thanks, Sam. Um, there's an interesting question, slightly different tack, um, coming uh, through on the Q&A. Um, this is looking more at kind of education, but um, how much does the panel consider quality education plays a role in terms of sustainability, which is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals? So um, what's the role really of quality education? Um, I, who'd like to on that? I mean, Heather, you're actually in education, so maybe you should start on that one. Um, I was just, I was actually going to type in uh, an answer. I mean, this is, um, you know, great question. Thanks, thanks, John. Um, we are, I mean, I can talk about UEL, but um, a few years back, we actually did move towards embedding sustainability within our new academic framework. Um, and, and not only that, it was also because uh, uh, currently the professional bodies such as the Royal Institute of British Architects is introducing new competencies that uh, all courses in, in architecture um, uh, will have to embed within their education. Um, this is the, the competencies take into account health and safety. Uh, they take into account climate literacy, which is actually the first one and um, ethical and professionalism. So um, it, you know, it, it really is coming in, I think, top down and bottom up. So it's being pushed by uh, professional bodies um, and also by academics, researchers, people in the industry, and obviously the, the, the world initiatives that are being taken um, in order to reduce carbon. Uh, but also I think we, we, are, we are, currently I, I know also that at schools, primary schools and secondary schools, there's a lot of focus now on sustainability, on uh, the climate change and on changing behaviors, people's behaviors. Um, so I, um, I think, yeah, I totally agree. I think, yeah, maybe if, if Craig, I don't know whether you'd like to come on this from a slightly different practice perspective, but you're obviously employing a lot of uh, people, it's a very large practice, um, coming from uh, different uh, educational backgrounds and so on. But um, how, how do you think the practice, what's practice looking for kind of in education around uh, sustainability? Uh, it's a very good question. I do, I do a little bit of teaching as well. I'm, a, I'm an external examiner at a, a university also. So I see a bit of both. Um, but in practice, we have our own um, internal kind of CPD process process which sounds extremely dull but we've always taken the view that um rather than getting kind of salespeople in to try and sell us their latest toilet cubicle or whatever it is they're hawking that week and um, we actually make it something useful to us and useful to the um mm -hmm. to the, the the kind of role that our architects are playing and the arb recently <coughs> updated their sustainability competencies for architects uh, <coughs> into quite a rigorous and quite a complex set of um 
things that they expect architects to be able to do. So actually that's given us um, an impetus in our practice to set out our education agenda for our sustainability related CPDs over the next year. So we're looking at all the things we talked about, about life cycle analysis and the impact of decisions um, of our, the architects making of specifying materials where they sit within the wider ecological hinterland. So we are we take a, a view that um, uh, there's a kind of four, part four, we're calling it, the sort of AHMM part four, where we, we take the architectural education into practice and we're continuing to learn and develop our skills. And over the last 18 months to two years, um, the carbon aspects in particular, uh, but sustainability in generally, um, the, the level of interest, um, if not knowledge, has, has, has risen massively. So we're, we're kind of currently rolling out um, those kind of explainers and info sheets that people can take and, and understand what they're doing better. But we're just on the, on the schools uh, front. Thanks a lot. I, no, sorry, carry on, carry yeah. on. Yeah, very briefly, because I, I think we've actually got to stop. We're kind of reaching the end of our time. Um, did you want to say something very quickly on that? Yeah, I just I I'm really sorry. love the idea of part four. That's fantastic. Um, I I think it's really important to make sure that education doesn't stop when we leave university or attain our part three. We need to carry on this CPD and, and sustainable practices are 100% part of that. And, and the ma mandatory competencies from the RIBA and the RLB, I'm so pleased that they're, they're coming, but we can do it faster. And I think uh, it's that's part of the reason I founded my company and a lot of the work that I'm doing with the Architects Climate Action Network is to make sure that directors, associates everyone in the uh, in the company is as prepared to deal with this emergency as as the graduating students because while the first school strikers are going to went started university this year um, they won't be in practices for another five years they won't be in a position of power for at least 10 years so we need to get there ready to accept them uh, in the industry Sorry, yes, if... so, Sam, th thank you very much. Um, we have actually, I think, reached the, the end of time um, for this particular part of the conversation. It'd be great to continue it uh, another, another day. Um, I'd like to, to thank you, uh, Ioma, uh, David uh, Walkley and Jane Calvert-Lee, who've um, set up and facilitated this webinar so skillfully. Um, sorry about the early bugs that we had, but... Um, I think if I could hand over uh, to David, perhaps to uh, to end the session. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I must apologise for all the technical problems that we've had this afternoon. Uh, it's some, been something of a nightmare because I, I could see what was going on, but I couldn't hear a single word of what was being said. So I just have to go by people's mouth movements. And I'm very grateful to Jane Calvert Lee for giving me prompts to remind me who it was who was uh, speaking and I'm sorry if it detracted in any way from the enjoyment of this um, webinar. Um, I, I have to say, though, even though I didn't hear a word of what was being said, it did seem like um, a very animated uh, discussion. And I hope that uh, all of our participants uh, gain something from the session this afternoon. It really just remains for me to say thank you very much to all of our panellists for doing such a fantastic job in difficult circumstances. Also to thank uh, Jane uh, for prompting me from behind the scenes. I'm sorry that um, the technical difficulties don't allow me to show the normal closing slides that we have. Uh, just to tell you a little about, bit about the reports that I all are able to uh, offer our members uh, and our partners. And also to remind you that we will be having our next webinar in a fortnight's time. We have these webinars every other Thursday. So it just remains for me to really to say thank you very much to everybody involved and to ask all of you when you exit today, if you would uh, please log off now 
and when you exit, you should be shown a feedback form uh, to give your views on the content of today and any desires and wishes that you have for future webinars. So for me, uh, thank you once again and uh, many apologies. Uh, and it's um, good my from me, as they say. Thank you. Thank you all.